Are you an artist working in physical media, looking to improve your photography skills to promote your work online? Are you struggling with glare from your oil paintings or how to get your colours accurate? Well, in this video I'll show you everything you need to know to beautifully photograph your artwork from start to finish. From what equipment you'll need and how to use it, through to post-processing and formatting. Hi, I'm Will J. Bailey. This is a channel of tutorials and documentaries for artists and art lovers with new videos every few weeks. If you're new here, make sure to hit subscribe so that you don't miss out. You can find links to everything discussed in the description below. So now more than ever, it's crucial to present your work well when displaying it online. Whether you're selling paintings on your website and online galleries, or just promoting yourself through your portfolio and social media, copy photography is a really useful skill to have and having beautiful photographs of your work can really help you stand out. Now, photography can be a bit intimidating, geeky and expensive. And it's true, some of it is very technical and maybe it won't be for everybody, though hopefully this video will help. And it definitely does require an investment in time and money. But I think for a lot of artists, that investment will be well worth it and pay itself off with interest, particularly as learning photography can be really useful for other parts of your practice too. Good quality photographs make for better reference images, as well as work in progress and behind the scenes shots. And in our social media landscape, when the demand for quality content is so high, having those skills can be a real asset. And this has certainly been the case for me anyway. Finally, if you keep developing your skills and experience and eventually invest in professional level equipment, you'll be able to make archival fine art prints from your work, potentially increasing sales whilst minimizing costs. Professional art reproduction services are not cheap, and this can only be good for business. Now I've tried to aim this video at a beginner to intermediate level, and it will be in three parts. In part one, I'll talk about equipment. In part two, I'll show you how to set up your camera and a mini home studio to shoot your artwork. This will include a section on how to use cross polarization to completely eliminate glare when photographing your oil paintings. In part three, I'll show you how to process and format your photos using Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. The essential gear that you need for copy photography is a camera, lens, tripod, two lights with stands, a computer with post-processing software, and a monitor. Optional extras include polarizing filters, a monitor calibrator, and a color calibration card or gray card. Now there is an alternative to using photography, of course, and that's scanning. And this comes with advantages and disadvantages. On the plus side, a home scanner is incredibly easy to use and very quick. On the downside, they are very small. Some are A3, but most are A4. Also, they're not actually that cheap. An A3 scanner designed for art or graphics reproduction can cost between 500 and 4,000 pounds. Also, machines with a CIS sensor are hopeless at copying uneven surfaces and even slightly warped paper will blur. The image needs to be perfectly flat against the glass. So if you do get one, make sure it has a CCD sensor as they are apparently much better for this. Alternatively, you could use a professional print lab scanner. Their high-end large format machines generally go up to A1 in size and should give you beautiful reproductions, though apparently they can have an issue with the layered, textured, glossy surfaces of oil paintings. This does represent an ongoing cost though, and there are logistical issues too, especially if you don't live in a city. So there are pros and cons to scanning, and whether it's right for you will depend on your circumstances and the type of work that you make. If you do go down that route, keep watching though, as post-processing, color correction and formatting are relevant for both. So which camera should you buy? Well, that's a difficult question, because there are so many variables. What's your budget? Are you going to be using it for other types of photography or video? It's impossible to recommend one camera that will suit everybody's differing needs. So can you use a phone camera? Well, sure you can, but you won't be showing off your work to its full potential. At the very least, use a tripod, light it properly and download a third party app so that you can shoot in RAW and edit it afterwards. But the truth is, even the best camera on the most expensive phone on the market isn't really good enough for copy photography, especially for bigger pieces. The lens and sensor are just too small to capture all the detail with edge to edge sharpness and accurate color. For that, you really do need a full fledged camera. With that in mind, here are some tips and pointers. Firstly, buy second hand. Camera equipment is built to last and there's a very healthy second-hand market for it. 
If you buy new, like with a car, as soon as you take it home, it will immediately take a substantial hit in value. Now, camera bodies will always drop in price over time as technology moves on. But if you buy second hand, the depreciation is so much less severe. So you can sell it later and upgrade without losing too much money. So eBay is the cheapest way to do this, but normally sellers don't offer returns or a warranty. So there is a degree of risk. However, I have bought a camera and several lenses secondhand on eBay without any problems. As always, it's important to check the seller's history and reviews. These should give you a good sense of who you're buying from. Hopefully you can find a hobbyist who hasn't used it much. Alternatively, if you buy from a trustworthy secondhand retailer like Wex Photographic, Park Cameras or MPB here in the UK, you pay more than on eBay, but they check and grade them. They tell you the shutter count and normally they allow you returns and offer you a warranty. Secondly, no one brand of camera is inherently better than the next, despite how fiercely loyal some people can be. I love my Fuji and my Canon, but Nikon and Sony both make great cameras too. They all have their pros and their cons. Canon is the biggest manufacturer in the world, so maybe they offer better value for money on the second-hand market, but it's better to keep an open mind. Thirdly, get a camera with manual control and interchangeable lenses. So forget about point and shoots and fixed length mirrorless. DSLRs are the most popular type of camera and so probably offer the best value for money, but modern mirrorless cameras like the Fuji X series are just as good. You should be looking at a minimum of around 24 megapixels and don't go smaller than an APS-C sensor. Now, full frame or even medium formats are undoubtedly the best for copy work. That's what a professional would use. But you're looking at thousands, not hundreds for one of those. So for most people, especially if you're just starting out, APS-C or crop sensor is probably your best bet. Finally, if you plan to use your camera to do work in progress shots or videos, a flip out screen is really useful, though not essential. So bearing all that in mind, set down your needs and work out your budget. Do a bit of online research and pick a couple of options. If possible, go to a reputable specialist camera shop to look at them and handle them in person. Ask the staff there for a bit of advice, they're usually very knowledgeable, and buy second hand. Personally, if I was looking for a great budget camera to get started with right now for under £500, I'd go for a Fujifilm X-T2. That camera is well specced and great value. But as I said, I'm biased. A slightly cheaper alternative would be a Canon 200D. When it comes to lenses, definitely buy a prime lens over a zoom. Don't just make do with the kit lens that comes with a budget camera. Prime lens, which have a fixed focal length, are much better for copy work. They contain less glass and moving parts and are usually sharper and have less distortion. To save money, buy your camera body only and get a prime lens separately. Also, people tend to upgrade their cameras much less often than their lenses, as digital camera technology moves on and dates relatively quickly, but lens technology doesn't. So you should buy your lens either in the same range as your camera or higher. Don't get a mid-range camera with a budget lens. If you're going to spend more, spend it on the lens, as you may well end up holding onto it long after you upgrade the camera. A case in point, the lens I use to shoot my artwork is a Canon EFS 60mm f2.8. It was released 15 years ago and it still holds up today, but it only cost me £215 second hand. It's definitely worth getting a macro lens if you can. They're ideal for copy work because they're specifically designed to be sharp as this one is. And macros also work really well for doing extreme close-up of paintings, drawings and work in progress techniques, as well as being great for portraits. Now don't go wider, i.e. lower than a 50mm focal length. The wider the focal length, the more distortion you get. 80-100 to 100 is ideal really, but bear in mind that the longer you go, the further back the camera has to be from the subject. So a 100mm lens might not be suitable if the space you're going to be shooting in is too small. Longer focal lengths also tend to be more expensive, as they're bigger with more glass. On the other hand, there are quite a few reasonably priced 50mm lenses out there. The next piece of equipment you need is a tripod. This is essential. To get the necessary sharpness, there can't be any shake, so the camera must be mounted. You don't need anything particularly fancy. As long as it's sturdy, most tripods will do. My wife uses a cheap Velbon. It costs around 40 quid and it's a bit plasticky, but it's perfectly up to the job. If you can spend a bit more though, check out the Vanguard Alta Pro 2 aluminium with ball head. I have one and it's brilliant. It's really sturdy and well made, but the best thing about it is the multi-angle center column. This makes it so versatile. It allows you to place the camera over the top of your work if you're working at a desk, or over your shoulder if you're working at an easel, which is brilliant for making of and work in progress shots and video. So next we come to the lights. 
Good lighting is really important for copy work. You need to have two lights on adjustable stands with exactly the same output. One light won't do because of what's called light fall off, caused by the inverse square law, a physics principle which states that light falls off two stops for every doubling in distance from the light source to the subject. This basically means that if you light a painting from one side only, the other side will be substantially darker. You need to light from both sides to get even distribution. Now I have heard some people on the internet recommend shooting outside using daylight as a budget option. I tried this when I first started out and it didn't work for me at all. Maybe it would be possible if you had good outside space set up on a bright overcast day, but good luck with both of those if you're living in London. Even then, I think getting even lighting will be almost impossible, particularly with glossy media. If I'm in a rush, I do on occasion use a couple of desk lamps, one on either side of the piece with the spots of the lights hitting the table just outside the image with the camera positioned above using my 35mm lens. It works, it's quick, and it's good enough for putting small pieces on Instagram, but I wouldn't do this for anything bigger than A3. But it is handy. It's how I shot this portrait of my wife that I did in my sketchbook recently. But for best results though, and particularly if you work big, a decent pair of lights is key. So there are two main categories of lighting, continuous and flash. Continuous lights can be LED, fluorescent, tungsten or halogen. Tungsten and halogen are a bit antiquated these days. I used to have a couple of 500 watt tungsten lamps and they were relatively cheap and very bright, but they got so hot, they'd quickly heat the whole room up and would seriously burn you if you touched them. And I dread to think how much electricity they use. Plus the bulbs were 10 pounds each and quite sensitive. Fluorescent lighting heads contain one or more spiral bulbs, similar to the ones that you might use at home, though with higher wattage. These are probably the cheapest option. You can pick up a two light kit, including stands on Amazon from a Chinese manufacturer like Niwa, for as little as 70 pounds. LED lights come in two types. The first is a panel containing hundreds of individual LEDs and are primarily designed for video. Battery powered ones like my Falcon Eyes Pocket Light F7 are relatively expensive at £120 each and they're not that powerful, but they are highly portable, adjustable and versatile. They can be mounted on stands or on a camera or just placed anywhere really. They offer a full spectrum of hues and whites and also double up as a disco light. I mainly use mine as a fill light for my videos. You can get bigger panels, more suitable as key lights, but they tend to be quite expensive, though again there are some budget options available. The other type of LED is a mono light with a single powerful chip, and this is the type I use. Mine are Godox SL60Ws. Godox is another name for Niwa, they're the same company. I bought them to light my videos, but they're effective for copy work too. They're powerful enough and relatively affordable at £100 each, excluding stands. The other main category of light is flash which delivers a short burst of light. These come in two types, studio flash heads, known as strobes, and flash guns, known as speed lights. The speed lights are compact, light, can be mounted on a camera, used in hand, or on a stand. They're a great addition to any photographer's kit, as they're portable, versatile, and affordable. I have a couple, and I use them off camera with a controller for macro photography and when shooting indoors. You can also use them for lighting portraits. They range in price from 30 to 800 pounds each. You definitely can use them for copy work too, though maybe not for really big pieces. Strobes are large units which produce a powerful light. They're generally mains powered and are primarily used in the studio, though some have battery packs and can be used outside too. They're what you find in any professional studio. They're powerful and highly controllable. Generally, strobes are really expensive, ranging from a few hundred to several thousand. However, recently budget brands like Niwa and Interfit have released much more affordable options. The Niwa S400N costs £87 each on Amazon. You'd also need to get stands and a wireless trigger kit, so all in you're probably looking at £200 to £250. The final essential piece of equipment is a computer with post-processing software. You can use Windows or Mac, it doesn't matter. You can even use a tablet these days, though I'm not sure I'd recommend it. If you're editing large RAW files, you'll need a computer with at least a moderate amount of processing power and RAM, and a half decent monitor. Ideally, you want a good quality IPS monitor specifically designed for graphics, with high resolution, 100% sRGB colour space, and high colour accuracy. 
Now, these aren't cheap though. I have a BenQ PD2700U, which is a really good budget to mid-range design monitor, and that costs £420. You can see it back there. For editing, I use Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop, and I have done for decades. They're the industry standard, and they're brilliant. Now, I'm sure a lot of you will be using these already. I know that some people are put off by the subscription model of £120 per year, but I don't mind it. I use them all the time, so for me, it's totally worth it. But there are alternatives. The only one I've tried is Affinity Photo. Honestly, it's not as good, but it is a lot cheaper with a one-time purchase price of £50, and it'll probably do the job. Okay, so that covers the essentials of camera, tripod, light, and editing. There are some other pieces of equipment that you might want to seriously consider though. Top of the list is a color calibration tool for your monitor, like the Data Color Spider. It's a piece of hardware that you place on your screen and the software reads the output and adjusts the color profile to be accurate to international standards. Another extra worth considering is a color checker card like the Data Color Spider Checker. The card contains a number of very precisely printed color tiles. When photographing your work, you take one picture holding the card up, then when you come to edit it, you use the software to cross-reference the tiles to color grade your photos. Now this isn't essential because you can do this by eye, but if you don't get one of these, at least get a gray card like this so that you can set your white balance correctly. There's plenty of cheap ones on Amazon. Finally, if you're photographing glossy media and you want to eliminate glare using cross-polarization, you will need to buy filters. I'll go into more detail on this in a bit, but basically one of the tricky parts of photographing oil paintings in particular is the light bouncing off all the shiny bumps and crevices of your varnished canvas, which just kills the detail of the photo and looks terrible. However, you can eliminate this by using a linear polarization filter on the lens of your camera in conjunction with another linear polarization filter over the lights. By the magic of science, it filters the light waves and the glare disappears. Honestly, it really is like magic. You'll be amazed at how well it works. To do this, you need to buy a sheet of linear polarization plastic filter to go over the lights and a glass linear polarization filter like this for your lens. Note that most polarization filters on the market are circular, not linear. This is because linear filters also stop the autofocus from working properly, but circular filters don't, so they're more popular. Now you can use a circular filter, but it will only eliminate most of the glare, but not all of it. So check the thread size of your lens and get a linear polarization filter in that size. Again, I'll leave a link below. Okay, so that's it for the first part of this video. In the next part, I'll show you how to set up and use your camera and lights and shoot your artwork.